this dramatic wheel stand. At this year's Winter Nationals, he survived an even more spectacular ride. Today, Sports World takes you there. Pomona Raceway, east of Los Angeles, where for the 29th consecutive year, the superstars of drag racing have gathered for the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals. Hello, everyone. I'm Gary Gerald. And it's always with a tremendous amount of anticipation and with high expectations that the superstars of this sport and their thousands of backers gather for the Winter Nationals here at Pomona. This year, this event kicks off the busiest and the richest season in the history of NHRA competition. 18 events around the country, $17 million in prize money on the line. And already a dramatic turn of events for one of the top names in top fuel competition, the quickest man in the world, Texan Eddie Hill. The drama unfolded two days ago during a qualifying run, when nearly two-thirds the way down the track at well over 250 miles per hour, Hill experienced a full blowover and a horrifying flip. Eddie Hill was experiencing the nightmare of every top fuel driver. Amazingly, moments later, Hill was able to unbuckle and to scramble away from the cockpit of his crashed racer. Minutes later, Steve Evans talked with Eddie. Feeling okay? Yeah, I don't think I got hurt at all. Bang my knees just a tiniest little bit, and I got a little pain right here, but I'm looking awful good. Now, usually you get some warning of something like that earlier in the run. Yeah, this deal here seemed like it happened awful fast. And another thing, too, I, I was not expecting it that far down the track. And uh, it was so unexpected, I uh, hardly ever have to lift at that stage of the racetrack. So uh, it'll be interesting to try to figure out what caused that. And Ursa, your wife, is already talking about trying to borrow a car from somebody to put your motor in. Are you ready for that? Uh, we need something to ride. I think I hurt that one pretty bad. <laughs> Indeed you did. After destroying the only car they brought to Pomona, Hill and his crew borrowed a bare frame from Daryl Gwynn, and an amazing all-night construction project got underway. Under the direction of crew chief Buzzy Carter, this team accomplished overnight what should take as long as a week. And as daylight returned to Pomona, Eddie's wife, Ursie, watched the completion of the time-consuming details that would lead to the long-shot opportunity to qualify in the final session a brand new car. You can look at this two ways. You can look at it as a tragedy yesterday or as a very joyous occasion. When my husband walked away from a potentially fatal accident, uh, the NHRA has wonderful safety rules. I don't think you can make the cars any safer than they are. And I'm glad that he's going to go back and, and try it again today. From another angle, we can see the apparent cause of this blip. Notice the front wings right over the axle. They're tilted down for pressure on that front end to keep the car from blowing over. Suddenly, they lose their location. They neutralize, and the car begins to fly. That's also at the point where the clutch locks up, applying all the horsepower to the rear wheels. 1,900 pounds of steel and aluminum flies like a feather. A 12-second ride that must have seemed like a lifetime for Eddie Hill. And while it may have been a lifetime for Hill, it presented an enormous challenge for crew chief Fuzzy Carter, who had to get a new car ready to qualify. Well, Fuzzy, you're about to strap your best pal into another one of these missiles. How do you feel about it? I feel pretty good about it. I think we've got everything situated and just hope we can get in the show. And with the backing of loyal and certainly vocal Southern California fans, the time had come to warm up a new engine in a new car. 
And with that hurdle cleared and with a boost of adrenaline, the crew knew that they still had one shot to make the qualifying field in the final qualifying session. They had, however, to run an elapsed time of 5.36 to make the field. And here was that scene late yesterday afternoon. Thumbs up from the Texan Eddie Hill. One final attempt at making the Winter Nationals top fuel field. With the fatigue and the tension of the round-the-clock effort etched in the face of Ursie Hill, it was time for Eddie to leave the line. He needed a 5.36 to qualify. And he did it with a 5.25. The miracle effort had produced the big dividend. Oh, man, I'm so tickled to be here. I can't tell you, but uh, we got good news and bad news. The good news, we got in. The bad news, I don't think we got enough stuff left to make the first round. We kicked another blower off this time. That's three engines now this weekend. So an already exhausted crew was faced with another extended effort, having to rework the motor that had been damaged in the qualifying run. Like a pencil mark to the right of Fuzzy Carter's finger, a four-inch crack was found in the block. Well, that potentially dangerous crack, plus the long list of borrowed parts, including a complete car from Daryl Gwynn, led to this situation, Gary. Ironically, Eddie Hill raced Daryl Gwynn in round one of top fuel earlier today. Knowing that engine could explode and press too hard, Eddie came to the starting line just idling in case something should happen to Gwynn, he would take advantage. Otherwise, this marathon would be over. But there were no problems for Daryl Gwynn. In fact, he ran a sizzling 507, 279 miles per hour. And an amazing weekend for Eddie Hill was over, despite the generous contributions of competitor Daryl Gwynn. We uh, think a lot of Eddie and his entire team, and we have no regrets loaning Eddie that car, and I mean that sincerely. And uh, let's hope someday that will come back to us. You know, we look at the good side and we look at the bad side, and uh, we see no regrets loaning Eddie that car. Someday, if you're in need, you know, the payback will come. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. And so it's Daryl Gwynn who now advances to the next round at Pomona. But even in the face of all the adversity and the great frustration of this weekend, certainly the popularity of Eddie Hill has never wavered among his legion of fans. Now to bring us up to date on other activities that have already taken place, let's go back to Steve Evans. Wow. When they say thunder in the pipes around here, they're not kidding. That was the sound of Gary Ornsby's 4,000 horsepower at Top Fuel Dragster warming up for the second round of eliminations to come in just a few minutes. Now, earlier today, in round number one, defending NHRA champion and low qualifier here, Joe Amato. Well, he did not have an easy opponent, as Daryl Glenn did. He went up and spoke. Frank Bradley went on to win that contest. But I talked to Joe at the other end. As always, he was smiling. Well, Steve, you know, the track it was treacherous out there. We just were afraid because the sun never came out to heat it up, you know. Just, I guess we'd overpowered it. We were trying to be conservative, but everybody's running so, so good. It's really uh, a tough one, but, you know, that's racing. So that brings us now to the second round of top fuel competition. Eight survivors, including Carol Gwynn, who last year came within an eyelash of winning the Winston Championship. And Daryl's opponent here will be that giant killer, Frank Bradley, who we saw earlier defeat Joe Amato in the first round. And you know, Gary, as far as Frank Bradley is concerned, when he first got into a top field director, Daryl Gwynn was in about the second grade. He's from nearby Orange, California. And you can bet he knows that that man in the other line from Florida, Daryl Gwynn, has won the last four out of six races here at Pomona. He is almost invincible on this pavement. So Gwynn, who has had the impeccable record at Pomona, staging now, Bradley already in position in the far lane. Quite a mechanical difference between these two cars. The transmission in Daryl Gwynn's machine, he shifts it. Frank Bradley just stands on the throttle. It's high gear only, the newest thing in drag racing. Smoking the tires, Gwynn Bradley also with a problem, but Bradley will prevail. And Gary, I think on this cold racetrack, high gear was an advantage for Frank Bradley. And Bradley, who eliminated Amato, has now sidelined last year's six-time winner, Daryl Gwynn. This is NBC's Sports World, and today it's brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Budweiser, beats with age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By Ford Motorcraft, get the peace of mind of doing it right with the right parts. Motorcraft quality parts. And by Castrol, the motor oil engineered for today's smaller cars. Back 
Mike in Pomona for the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals, the kickoff event of the NHRA championship season for 1989. Getting ready now for a second round matchup between Dennis Forcell in the near lane doing the burnout against veteran driver and former champion Gary Beck on the far side. Well, Gary Beck has been uh, in semi-retirement. He's a two-time Winston Top Field champion, concentrating on a career in the construction industry and developing a brand new drag racing engine. We'll talk about just a little bit later. The fans glad to see Gary Beck competitive again. In the first round, Beck faced Jim Head. Head, who just made the field as the 16th fastest qualifier, was in the far lane, and Head ended up having a wild ride of his own. And what you're about to see is what could have happened, even worse possibly, to Eddie Hill had he run that engine with a crack block. So the misfortune for Head gives Beck a matchup now with Dennis Forcell, last year's NHRA Top Fuel Rookie of the Year. And here is what Forcell is up against. Sitting behind Gary Beck is the 4-cam 32-valve McGee motor, the newest thing in drag racing. Actually, two Australian brothers, the McGees, have been working on this engine for over a decade, Gary. And this is the first time it has truly performed. 282 miles per hour in qualifying. They're on to something. And a major test right now for that power plant and for driver Gary back in the far lane as he stages with Dennis Forcell. Forcell on the near side has the jump. And the McGee not responding to the challenge. Forcell in 5'11", 269 miles per hour, eliminates Gary Beck. And it didn't appear really that McGee motor was at fault there. They just uh, missed the clutch settings. Kenny Bernstein back in the staging lanes mixing a, a final batch of fuel for his funny car, the four-time champion. He, too, is interested in that McGee motor. In fact, he'll start testing it pretty soon. And, of course, funny car competition will be coming up shortly here at Pomona in the Winter Nationals. And, Gary, a bit of a panic in the top fuel staging lanes. That is Tim Farrell, a crewman for Connie Coletta, running over to the car they're going to race the Frank Holly machine to borrow apparently some sort of a tool. There must be something wrong with Coletta's car, and they don't have the proper tool, and they may have it now, though. Now, certainly a sense of urgency there for the Coletta crewman. Meanwhile, Gary Ormsby getting set to go against Jack Ostrander now in their second round top fuel matchup. Meanwhile, the Coletta crew apparently has corrected whatever problem they were facing as they now roll closer to the staging area. But just in front of them is the race to come. Jack Ostrander, manager of a bowling alley in one cup, part-time drag racer in the bar lane, up against Gary Ormsby, car dealer from Auburn, California, in a beautiful new car that is the clock of the field. And again, Ormsby away brilliantly, and he's got another hot one going. Another 5.07, this one 280 miles per hour. Ormsby to the semifinals. And the problem with Connie Coletta's car was that air bottle that controls the lockup of the clutch. Apparently some air was escaping. They got it sealed back up before it lost pressure. So he's all right. Connie Coletta had a brilliant qualifying effort. In fact, he set an all-time speed record of 291 miles per hour, the first in the 290 mile per hour bracket. And look at the launch on that run. The front wheels popped in the air. Coletta hammered it the floor. He had a new all-time drag racing speed record. The car's really flying down there. It's a beautiful ride, I'll guarantee you. You know, a lot of people give you credit for the first to go 200 miles an hour. It's fun to do these things. Oh, it sure is, Steve. It's, this man makes it all, and it adds it all up on top. You know, the experts all thought it would be Gwen or a motto that would do this. Not so. Connie Coletta, why? Well, we've been working on the car. You know, we started last fall when I got the high gear set up in the new car. And just everything sort of fell in place, and the fuel system was working right for it. And we put after we get a little more nitro, a little more volume, and it just loves it. How fast will it go? God knows. <laughs> <laughs> so a milestone performance for Connie Coletta, who now faces Frank Hawley. Hawley, a two-time funny car champion, now competing in top fuel. And driving for team owner Larry Miner, who has had a tough morning. His other director, Dick LaHaye, was beaten by Connie Coletta, who's now trying to get to Holly. And his funny car, driven by Ed McCulloch, was put out by Mark Oswald. It's Holly on the far side. Coletta, the new all-time speed record holder in the near lane, in his familiar bounty hunter. Staged and ready to launch. Off the line, smoking the tires. Problems for Coletta. Holly will advance. 5'12", 279 miles per hour. Miner is happy, but look, a problem is there are a lot of sparks coming out from underneath Frank Holly's machine. But despite the problems, Hawley is in the semifinals against Frank Bradley, and Hawley, with a quicker elapsed time, has lane choice. The other semifinal pairing has Ormsby against Forcell. Ormsby has the lane selection.
car competition, Funny Car is the ultimate evolution of a full-bodied racing machine. We just saw the four-time champ, Kenny Bernstein. Here's his opponent in the second round. This is Tom Hoover of Minneapolis, unleashing all of that power to get those rear tires hot, sticky, and ready to race. Tom Hoover saw a real uh, renaissance in his career late last season. A lot of big things expected from the man from Minneapolis. The engine in his car, as always, prepared by his 83-year-old father, George. And in the first round, Hoover found himself up against John Force, the quickest qualifier in the field. The man that we saw win the Winston Finals last fall here on Sports World. And this matchup produced a two-fold surprise. First, it was Hoover off the line, beating Force. Then, Force had no parachute. He couldn't stop the car. And look at the result. was okay, but as you might imagine, he had a lot to say when he got out. Shoes didn't come out. Tore him clear of the roof. I was going to make the curve. I wasn't going to roll her. I thought I could put her in the sand, but she bit. She bit in head first. Like any driver would have done what you were doing. You weren't carrying that much speed. No, uh, I was trying to get the shoots out. I was trying to make a decision here. Uh, I just said, she ain't, she ain't going to make that curve. I ain't going to look like no fool here and have her flip over and... I said, put her in the sand, but I never thought she had dug in. That baby dipped on me, hooked the nose, and what a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Your family's down here, John. Let them know you're okay. I'm okay. Always the showman, Force and his family, climbed on the tow truck with the damaged body of the car and drew the plaudits of an amazed Pomona crowd. And Gary, win or lose, there's always a story where John Force is concerned. And so now, Tom Hoover faces Kenny Bernstein and his brilliant crew chief, Dale Armstrong. Kenny won his fourth consecutive title last season that ties the mark held by Don the Snake Perdome, and he set sail here at Pomona for what could be a fifth title unprecedented in NHRA drag racing. And Bernstein struggled to make the field. He did not get in until his final qualifying pass. He had been 18th on the list. And off the line, Bernstein with the advantage. The luck has run out for Hoover. Bernstein moves to the semifinal round. 543, 269 miles per hour. Our next pairing has Chris Lane going against Mark Oswald. This is Oswald in the Candies and Hughes machine getting powered up. He eliminated Ed McCulloch in the first round. And in so doing, picked up Lane choice for this second round competition against Lane. Oswald, the perennial runner-up, it seems, to Kenny Bernstein in the championship chase, has suddenly elected now to change lanes. He wants to go in the lane where Bernstein just ran the 543, and that'll put Chris Lane on the side of the track where Tom Hooper just had control problems. Steve? Well, the experience of the four-time championship team is really starting to show. A 543, maybe all this track will take from a funny car. Yeah, it may be. It's hard to tell up there, but uh, obviously it's good enough to get to the third round, and that's what you're all doing it for. We thought it might go a little quicker, but I actually softened it a little on that run on the starting line. You're going to have to keep your eye on the weather. The sun is out right now. That'll make a difference. Oh, yeah, it will. It'll warm it up a little, but, you know, it's pretty cool out here now. I don't think it's going to change a whole lot between now unless we get to the final. It's nighttime. Okay. Hope we see you there. Thank you, Steve. So Kenny Bernstein advances, veteran NHRA starter Buster Couch watching as Oswald now backs up after his burnout, getting into position for his side-by-side -side run with Chris Lane. Mark Oswald, a pro driver, a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, driving for Candies and Hughes for the sixth year. Chris Lane has been a funny car competitor for many years, but always on a local basis, primarily in his home state of Arizona. But what fun he is having here, a potential of a semi-final round berth at the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals, a dream come true. Lane on the near side, the 15th quickest qualifier going against Oswald, who has 13 career victories to his credit, and he has made the switch of the lanes. He thinks he has the upper hand. Both cars sideways off the line. Both men back into it. Oswald with the advantage, but here comes Lane, and Lane with a stunning upset. Forget the numbers. Both men had problems, but it's Lane who advances, and Mark Oswald is eliminated in a giant surprise. In replay, watch the car on the floor. Lane, the scoop on top of the hood. Those are the butterfly injectors. Now, when the tires break loose, watch how hard Oswald tries to regain traction. That's what they call pedaling one of these cars. So after the major surprise, the crowd of some 50,000 settling back, getting ready for the next pairing. John Martin will be going against Bruce Larson. 
And Eddie Hill isn't the only fuel racer to have engine problems. That man, Bruce Larson, is on his third engine in that Oldsmobile body car. He's just got to pray right now, Gary, that it holds together for the duration of the event if he can keep on winning. Larson eliminated Don Prudhomme in the first round, and he's ready now to go against John Martin, a veteran driver from Southern California, who is the eighth quickest qualifier on the field. Now, John Martin has had a certain amount of success here at Pomona. He's been to the semifinals on two occasions, so Martin will not be an easy one for Bruce Larson. Larson, who won his first NA3 event last season. On the near side of the track, Larson with the advantage. He'll have the victory easily. Problems developing for Martin. And Larson with a 5.32. That equals the qualifying time that was number one for John Force. And Gary, remember that smoke you pointed out uh, Mark Oswald's car? Well, Mark just told us the supercharger drive belt came off. He had no power to hold off Chris Lane. Meanwhile, back in the pit area, we're watching activity around the Dennis Forcell machine. The top fueler is getting maintenance. They're getting set for a semifinal matchup with Gary Ormsby. That could be a classic. Now, Steve is standing by with Bruce Larson. Well, here is the man that has the competition shaking their heads, Bruce Larson. Another 532, two in a row. Great, glad to hear that. I shut off early again. That's only two hundredths away from a from a world record on a racetrack some call a less than ideal. Well, something's really puzzling us. The air's so good that it's fooled us. We've used up three engines in the last two days, and it keeps burning it down. The air is fantastic, and we like the track. The track's terrific. All right, keep this one in one piece, huh? Oh, we sure will. Thanks a lot. Oh boy, is he on a roll? So back-to-back -back rounds of 532 for Bruce Larson. He's a happy man, and he'll be facing in the semifinals either this man, Jim White, who upset the second quick qualifier, Mike Dunn, in the first round, or Art Hendy, who eliminated Scott Coletta in the first round. Local driver Art Hendy has done an amazing conversion from alcohol to nitro, jumping into the pros. Jim White, he is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the latest driver for Roland Leon. In fact, he is the 18th driver to wheel a race car for the man from Hawaii. White on the near side, Hendy to his left, both men inching into position. Off the line, advantage goes to White. And an easy victory for White, but a big puff of smoke at the end of a 555 run. The speed really dropped to 216 miles per hour. He may have damaged the power plant. He'll go against Bruce Larson. Larson will have lane choice in the first semifinal pairing. The second matchup, Bernstein against Lane. Bernstein with a quicker ET for lane selection. Top fuel, Frank Pauley getting set now to go against Frank Bradley. Frank Hawley, who teaches drag racing at his school down in Florida, up against Frank Bradley, who's been driving top fuel dragster since the motor was in front of the driver. And those were some scary days. Hawley, a past two-time funny car champ, hoping this year to get the top fuel title. A perfect start. Hawley is up in smoke, no doubt bitten by that brand new clutch. It is Frank Bradley winning it at 5.18 seconds. Gary Gerald is at the starting line with Frank Bradley's crew. Well, you got yourself in the finals. You got to be happy. Finally, finally. We haven't had much luck for the last couple of years. I think it's just turned around for us. We're really excited. Terrific. Thanks a lot. The smiles and the emotion tell the story as Bradley goes now into the final round in the NHRA Winter Nationals at Pomona. All right, here we go. Semifinals, top fuel. The most consistent car and driver of this entire event in the near lane, Gary Ormsby from Northern California. His reaction times have been simply unbelievable. He has been solidly consistent. Every run has been below 5-1. This is Dennis Forcell. He's been no slouch in the early rounds. He had a 5.09 and he qualified at 5.06. And there's his crew chief, Larry Frazier. Now he has his hand on one of the fuel control levels. When that car is pre stage right now, he'll change the fuel mixture. Now you see far more fuel coming out of the pipe. They richened up that whole system. Gary Ormsby in the near lane, Forcell four lane. It's Ormsby, another great start. Forcell hands in there, but cannot handle Gary Ormsby on this day. A terrific 5.05. Gary Gerald is on the starting line with true chief Lee Beard. Consistency has been the key. This has been a terrific weekend. 
Well, I agree with you. The consistency's here, but uh, it really started over the winter break. Our sponsor's behind us 100%. Gary's driving's better than ever. My crew has really matured into one of the best crews out here, and I think that that's what's made us consistent. Optimistic going to the finals? Well, we're just going to play it one round at a time here. I don't think we're going to change the setup on the car. That should probably cover the field right Thank there. You. And that 505 from Ormsby will give him lame choice in the finals against Bradley. And for Frank Bradley, a chance to duplicate a Winter Nationals victory last experienced in 1976. Stand out Gary Ormsby. Routine engine maintenance going on. We're back at the LA County Fairplex, Pomona, California, for the Cheap Auto Parts Winter Nationals drag races. I'm Steve Evans, along with Gary Gerald, and there you see four-time champ Kenny Bernstein being backed up by his crew chief, Dale Armstrong, after the burnout. Now, his opponent in this first of two semifinal matchups will be Chris Lane. But right now, there's a report of some problems with one of our semifinalists back in the pits. Here's Gary. Unfortunate problems for Roland Leong and Jim White, his driver. Unfortunately, they sheared a pin in a clutch arm, didn't realize it in the last run. Only when they got to go off the stage that they realized they had a problem. They're scrambling. They're down to the last few moments now to see whether or not they'll be able to go side by side with Larson in the semifinal round. Well, Gary, we sure hope they make it in time. Well, here is Chris Lane, and you have to know, going through his mind right now is, I've got an opportunity. I could really raise my stock in this board if I could put away the most famous running car driver of them all, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Lane in big problems, almost hits the wall. Bernstein goes to the finals, 548, 265 miles per hour. Chris Lane still has a little fire coming out from under that car, Gary. Meanwhile, as White's crew continues to scramble, earlier it was Eddie Hill running out of parts. Jim White has now run out of time. It means a bye run for Bruce Larson. He'll make a single pass, but he'll give it everything he has, I imagine, Steve, to try to get that lane selection. Oh, I assure you, he will go as hard as he can to get one more race in his hand against Kenny Burke. Oh, Larson has lost traction. That has got to make Jim White feel especially bad not to be able to stage when he had an opportunity here. Well, Bernstein, he may like that, though, with lane choice now. A bitter disappointment for White, but Larson advances. He'll go against Bernstein. The defending champion has lane selection by virtue of the quicker E.T. As the late afternoon sun slides behind the grandstands at Pomona, the shadows grow longer. In the kickoff event of the 1989 NHRA championship season, the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals. It's time for the Pro Stock Finals. Bob Glidden bidding for career win number 68 against 11-time career winner Frank Iaconio, Glidden on the near side. And a quick peek in the Bruce Larson pits as the crew puts together their lone surviving engine, hoping it has enough to handle Kenny Bernstein. That's all they have left to fire. And that, of course, will be in the funny car finals coming up in a matter of minutes. Right now, it's the Pro Stockers on the line for a Winter Nationals championship. Between these two men, Glidden and Iaconio, they have nine Winter National championships to share. Iaconio staged and waiting for Glidden. Iaconio usually likes to move in last, but he's away first. Glidden on the near side. Iaconio on the far side. Who's it going to be? Side by side down the track. Close call. Glidden. Glidden gets the win in 7.29. Super number for Glidden. The quickest pro stock run ever at Pomona. Take a look now as they came off the line. The Ford probe against the Pontiac. The probe on the near side handled by Glidden. This was a terrific run. Both men with great reactions coming off the line. And what more would you expect from men who've dominated this event in the past? Iaconio had the slight advantage as they neared mid-track. But then it was Glidden driving by him on the near lane to get the victory. Right, come here. A spectacular pro stock final as Bob Glidden rams the probe into the 720s, 188 miles per hour. Great job. Thank you, Steve. I'll tell you, the probe came through again. We came here with a new car, and uh, we couldn't be happier. I, we've got to get this guy in here. Guy Stern, get over here. It is good to have Frank Iaconio back. He will be an adversary, though. It's not so good for the rest of us, guy. I told Frank just a moment ago, I said, you know, I sincerely mean it. I'm glad to see you here, but I'm not looking forward to racing this guy. What do you think about that? Uh, I, I just thank him for the kind words, uh, Steve. I'm just happy to be here, and I'm glad he won. Hey. Thank you. Terrific pro stock race. 
And the seventh time that Bob Glidden has won the Winter Nationals at Pomona. Top Fuelers now on the line. Both veteran longtime rivals now in position. Bradley, the giant killer who knocked out Amato and Gwynn. And Ormsby, who's been a master of consistency. Off the line, Ormsby with the advantage. Ormsby stretching it out. And Gary Ormsby, for the second time in his career, is a Winter National winner with an unbelievable streak of 5 0 elapsed times. Incredible, Gary. In every round, he's been under a 5 1. We take another look as they came away from the line. The header flames and the gathering darkness at Pomona, a spectacular sight. And off the line, it was clearly Gary Ormsby's race to win. He won it in 1984. It's been five years, but he has duplicated the victory with a 506, 278 mile per hour run. Well, Gary, seldom has the sport of NHRA championship drag racing seen as flawless a performance as Gary Ormsby put on for all of us today. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to thank my crew. They're the one that did it. All I do is just push the pedal. <laughs> Lee, Brian, and Mike, and Chuck, they really did a nice job for me this weekend. Made me look good, didn't they? You had no breaks. You just beat every opponent. Uh, yeah, the car ran good. Again, that's a credit to them and the way this car was prepared this weekend. What do you do to hang on to a combination like this? Well, I don't know, but we're sure going to try, I'll tell you. <laughs> Again, congratulations. Your second Winter Nationals title. Thank you very much, Steve. Gary Ormsby, he's your champion. What a spectacular weekend for Ormsby and his crew, and what a weekend for this man, Bob Glidden. His celebration continues. And there's grandson Brandon now into the arms of a proud and happy grandpa. Back in Pomona, along with Steve Evans, I'm Gary Gerald, and we're watching the celebration get underway for top fuel winner Gary Ormsby in the NHRA Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals. Ormsby being congratulated by his longtime rival, Frank Bradley, who has to settle for the runner-up honors. And, Gary, that's the first time those two ever raced in a final. Not so with our funny car finalists. They met four times last year alone in final round. Well, you remember, Gary, Kenny Bernstein set up to round number two, that if the final run is run after the sun goes down, it'll be a whole nother racetrack. What kind of racetrack? Is it better? Is it worse? We're about to find out. Bernstein had lane choice, selected the same lane in which Gary Ormsby won top fuel. He has put Bruce Larson on the far lane. Bernstein was away first, but immediately lost traction. And there goes Bruce Larson to his second ever NHRA career victory. An outstanding performance today. Down on the starting line with Maynard Yank to Screw Chief is Gary. Maynard, can I get a word with you here? Listen, this has got to be one of the great experiences anytime you beat the defending world champion. Oh, it's nice to come out and win the first race of the year, and uh, it couldn't come for any more reward for this team. We changed four motors. We got one head left. That's what we have to our name that's healthy. And these guys, Ken Joe, uh, Don Militex, Randy Fisher, they worked really hard, and they deserve a lot of credit. Tim Richards and the Amato crew helped us out a lot, too, today. How apprehensive were you going to the final round? Well, uh... We, we were on a pretty good thrash, and we broke our routine. We skipped a lot of steps just to make it up here on time. I'm, I'm glad Kenny smoked his tires. We'll celebrate. <laughs> Thank you. Right. How much pressure are these guys under? Well, three motors, four motors, it's irrelevant now. The celebration is underway. A championship in the Winter Nationals for Bruce Larson. Steve? Well, some might call it an upset. Kenny Bernstein defeated in the final round, but by the quickest car of the entire event. You earned this one big time. How big? <laughs> you don't care about the lifestyle in the final 560s, sure. but your 532s, they were the backbreakers. It felt great. It felt great all weekend. We were just having trouble with burning the motor down, but uh, it felt good. And, you know, I've got to thank my crew. I've got to thank the Amato crew. They helped me out in a lot of pinches. And, you know, it's Century Gages put me here. All the good guys, you know, we really needed them. Were you nervous on the starting line? No. No, I've sat there beside him before, and uh, you just kind of grit your teeth and say you're going to get him. Congratulations. A big win for you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Steve. Bruce Larson, the true champion today. So Bruce Larson puts his...